Okay, so this is uh, lecture number 19 in the series about creating a sustainable international civilization today. Um, so, so far, the last six lectures have been about this meeting ethics in action, very religiously pluralistic, humanistic uh, meeting in Rome at the Pontifical Academy about finding a common ground for education and that would support the sustainable development goals. This particular lecture goes back to Mr. Marif's book and what he says about the kind of education he, think is, he thinks is truly Islamic, is also consistent with Panchasila, and is also something a foundation or uh, important consideration in the development of a curriculum for students at the Muhammadiyah schools in Indonesia. So what I wanna show is that yes, um, following that what Marif says is perfectly consistent with this meeting at the, at the Pontifical Academy and the United Nations, so. Now we're just about halfway through, so I thought I would um, once again post where these lectures are located. Um, I, I posted the lectures on this YouTube channel. Um, it's that's the name of the playlist. Um, I have other another YouTube channel. Hopefully, I will I will make a copy. But the other one focuses on Greek philosophy, which is why. I probably should have posted it there. But anyway, so these are things you could look at. All right, so how do we develop a system of education for, for wisdom? The, the conference ended with the importance of virtue ethics and incorporating contemporary science and STEM with the traditional virtue ethics and come up with something new. This is what I've always thought I've associated with systems thinking for, 50 plus years, actually, this idea of systems thinking or the paradigm, this paradigm switch has been um, presented for 70 years or more, but it just doesn't get traction. It is not the dominant view. It's not where the money goes. It's not where the educational system goes, but eventually things have to change. And I it's not going to be another 50 years. It's going to happen pretty quickly, I think, once it catches on. So Marif quotes from another writer who defines a comprehensive system of education for a Muslim who is both civilized and of good character and who makes the whole world a tangent of his curiosity and knowledge, a target of his curiosity and knowledge. This definition does not differentiate between what is termed religious knowledge and knowledge of the physical world, a dichotomy that is foreign to the eyes of the Quran, but has been retained as a myth for centuries in the world of Islam. So this is very important. And this is where the people I quoted at the conference would agree completely. Do, and he, he says, do not all his signs stretch to all corners of the universe. This is a quote from the Quran. And within humankind, do not the natural sciences, astronomy, history, sociology, geography, economics, and many others represent an organic part of Allah's signs. I think it's from the Quran, not sure. The integration of knowledge in a conceptual philosophical manner is not yet complete in the Islamic system of education. What we have witnessed is a system of education sheltering under one roof, while its spirit has long been split into two. Briefly, then, the learner, let me fix this, the learner who is meaningful in the eyes of the Quran is the one who's free from a personality that split and disintegrated. He or she is a good person, whole and complete, self-confident, and able to perform works on the face of the earth that are based on faith and pious deeds for the benefit of all creatures. Okay, sounds like the 
conference we've been to, or I just described, Marif knows that the problem of dualism is exacerbated by the West, where it is ubiquitous. Um, it's hard to be able to reject the West and come up with a curriculum that is just as sophisticated and will be respected as that of the West. Quote, will the quality of Islamic education become first rate in the long term? There's no quick answer to this so long as the dichotomy of religious education and Western style gen general education is not overcome. To this day, the Muslim Umat has not yet arrived at the concept of the unity of knowledge. So this is a big problem in the West that we have exported through colonialism. And I have said already, if you remember that Greek humanism was um, exported over to the Mideast and, there, and Islam at the beginning was integrated in a in a Aristotelian sort of Greek humanistic framework, and um, it's become more dualistic. There are branches of it that became then dualistic and anti-science and anti-intellectual, but the foundational um, values and what he reads, the way he reads the Quran, and especially as an Indonesian is that the goal is in integrity, which I think is the way to read the Quran too. It isn't just Indonesia. It's just that much more important if you are an Indonesian citizen. This is particularly difficult because Indonesian Muslims want an integrated curriculum and yet their students need to be competitive in science, math, engineering, and technology in order for Indonesia to develop economically. Indonesia is known for its failure to educate its children in the intellectual virtues. So that's my, that's not quoting Marif, this is me. Quote, even though illiteracy has been vanquished to a great extent, Indonesia as an independent nation has never developed or prioritized educational strategies. It is not competitive in science, technology, and economics. In the United Nations Development Program Report for 2015, Indonesia's Human Development Index ranked 113 out of 188. So this is bad, you have a long ways to go, but you've got a good foundation. Marif knows well the way Islamic education tries to be inclusive. Quote, the Quran itself seems drawn to three types of science for the benefit of humankind. First, the natural or physical sciences, those sciences that can be mastered by humanity. Second, history and geography. By wandering on the face of the earth, humankind will understand what has happened to civilizations in ages past, the factors that gave rise to them and the reasons for their downfall. Third, knowledge about humanity itself. What is meant by knowledge here is scientific knowledge because it's based on observations through the eyes and ears but ultimately that science is to touch the heart. In this way, humankind will transform its scientific and technological capabilities in accordance with oral perceptions that we hope will be born within humankind itself. So the knowledge has to be tied to character. Char character has to be um, the cultivation of the heart, emotions, empathy, um, so the knowledge should be in the service of human well-being. I think it's particularly interesting when they talk about geography and um, the evolution of civilizations, because, of course, Java man, <laughs> the skeleton was found on Java. And that is the oldest or one of the oldest uh, skeletons ever found. So Indonesia is, you know, very close to the center of when, where and when all this stuff began. The importance of Ijihad, again, I know I'm butchering the, the pronunciation, but I like the idea, Ijihad for developing an integrated curriculum. Marif also knows that discussions of human relationships can easily lead to disagreements, quote, because the scope of Islamic teaching goes beyond the realm of the personal in the sense that it also demands the proper arrangement 
of historical relationships within society at large as a reflection on the vertical relationships with God, many problems arise that need to be resolved. So this is the field of is-jihad, reason, judgment, and interpretation of the Quranic code in a broad sense. So the scholars that I work with are very much engaged in the process of is-jihad, although I personally like don't know the Quran and the history of Islam well enough to know exactly what they're doing. I just know that my friend Jarut has a journal on the history of Islamic civilization, and he publishes my work in his journal a lot, and he really likes it. So I would imagine that he uh, exercises his jihad, and the people who read his journal do, and um, at least he thinks that reading my work is very helpful in his work. So then I connect. The thing that I, my strength, is to connect this whole process of what Muslim scholars do to systems thinking. Because this is, this is what I fell in love with way back, um, probably in high school before I even read it. I was already thinking that way. So the emerging new scientific conception of life can be seen as a part of a broader paradigm shift from a mechanistic to a holistic and ecological worldview, a change from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. Um, and I have referred to this previously also, and I will refer to it again, the mechanistic view versus the organic view. Whitehead had that. Um, the whole 20th, 21st century, when I talked about ideas of God, they were connected to the switch to this new paradigm away from mechanism. The new scientific understanding of life at all levels of living systems, organisms, social systems, and ecosystems, is based on a perception of reality that has profound implications, not only for science and philosophy, but also for politics, business, healthcare, education, and many other areas of everyday life. Um, and so I could present lectures that specifically talk about thinking about healthcare in, in a systems way. I don't know how many, <laughs> how many people want to hear all this stuff, but this book, I recommend this book. It's excellent. It's long, it's plotting, it's very comprehensive, but that's why it's a good book and it's a good source. Ultimately, deep ecological awareness is spiritual awareness. When the concept of the human spirit is understood as the mode of consciousness in which the individual feels a sense of belonging, of connectedness to the cosmos as a whole, it becomes clear that ecological awareness is spiritual in its deepest essence. Hence, the emerging new vision of reality based on deep ecological awareness is consistent with the so-called perennial philosophy of spiritual traditions. And I have brought up the concept of perennial philosophy has, um, or primordial philosophy that has come up again and again with different scholars and scholars that don't necessarily read each other's work it's just that there's basic intuition. So that goes back to the notion of the axial age and how human consciousness emerged from a very basic perennial primordial awareness to this thinking awareness of thinking of thinking, the mind thinking itself. And that awareness emerged in different locations. And so that's why um, the culture related to it the cultural mythology, the, the training, all the other aspects of culture were are different, but they had that same original motive was to make this transition from um, just observing and just reacting and just seeing patterns to actually recognizing that that's what we do. And then we can start being visionary and being deliberate. So um so this is just an agreement that there is a basic foundation. 
All of the traditions in Panchasila I are based on the universal perennial philosophy. So they're compatible with systems thinking, even if they're not identical to it. Um, deep ecology asks profound questions about the very foundations of our modern scientific, industrial, growth-oriented, materialistic worldview and way of life. If it questions this entire paradigm from an ecological perspective, from the pers perspective of our relationships to each other, um, to future generations and to the web of life of which we are a part. And again, many, many scholars and all of the scholars at the Ethics in Action Conference I agree with this. Uh, the wisdom traditions versus modern knowledge. The change of thinking is also a change in values. Modern industrial culture has overemphasized the self-assertive and the self-assertive and neglected the integrated tendencies in human nature. Such a deep ecological ethic is urgently needed today, especially in science, since most of what scientists do is not life furthering and life preserving but life destroying. With physicists designing weapon systems of mass destruction, chemists contaminating the global environment, biologists releasing new and unknown types of microorganisms without knowing the consequences, psychologists and other sciences torturing animals in the name of scientific progress, it seems most urgent to introduce eco-ethical standards into science. Right, it's obvious, but this was what happened when the philosophy that God wants us to exploit nature for human well-being just got out of hand. So it went too far. How are we gonna stop this? Uh, the Frankenstein, uh, Mary Shelley's play or the sorceress, Sorcerer's Apprentice, these kind of things. This happens, you know, it's a paradigm that what started out as a good, well, the whole Greek thing about the mean between extremes, every character in a Greek tragedy, every um, deity in the Greek myths has a sacred calling. They have a meaningful activity, but they take it too far. And so the reason we take it too far and we're continually blinded is because we had the wrong philosophy. We really, they, the Enlightenment thinkers really did switch to Protestant, from Catholic to Protestant, and from believing, you know, that we have to integrate our purpose is to understand the universe, not to exploit nature, to the belief that God wants us to exploit nature. And so, up to what point is the question. And because it was a philosophy, uh, it's very hard to change it, change a paradigm. Um, all right, so this shows uh, we have a collective need for a system of education that combines Aristotle's moral and intellectual virtues leading to wisdom guiding knowledge. And um, Marif would agree with that the people at the conference, there is this convergence of all these different um, intellectuals around the world who want to develop such a curriculum. They can do it, they can develop a global cur curriculum or um, Marif can do it for the Mohammedia school system, uh, Mohammedia K through 12, and then the Islamic State Universities, um, they can, Islamic State Universities can develop it and um, instigate it in the Pasandran. So everybody needs to be sort of on the same page. And then within that, everybody um, engages in their own sort of branch of the same tree. 